Dog training does not have to be a time consuming thing. In this episode, I'm going to show you how to structure your training sessions to get the most out of them. Welcome to the Dog Guy Josh Show, a podcast about canine culture and lifestyle, hosted by Josh Pitts, a certified dog trainer. <music> Hey guys, welcome back to the show. And today we're going to talk a little bit about your training sessions and how to structure them. So we're going to answer a couple questions. We're going to talk about how many times per week should you train? How long should your training sessions be? How many treats do you need? Where do I train and what do I focus on? Uh, and how do I end my training sessions? And so hopefully this podcast will provide you with some, some quick tips to kind of uh, think about your training sessions for maximizing your time and getting the most out of them. Okay, if you're just starting out, I'm going to recommend that you only need to do about three sessions per week for about two to five minutes. I try to teach my dog one new behavior each week, and I advise that you do the same. You only need about one to two sessions to kind of get your dog familiar with the behavior that's being rewarded, the acquisition stage, as we talked about in a previous podcast. And then from there, you need, you know, sessions two to three to put your behavior on a verbal cue and begin practicing it for fluency. When you're doing your training sessions, focus on just one thing. So for example, if we're in the acquisition stage and we're teaching, you know, our dog to sit on cue. So I'll spend the first session just marking the behavior the moment my dog's butt hits the ground and it'll take about one to two sessions to, you know, let the dog know that the, the butt hitting the ground is, you know, what's being marked and rewarded and about two to three sessions after that to start saying sit, uh, you know, you no longer need your clicker after that. And then you can start rewarding your dog just for responding to your voice. So usually by the end of the third session, you know, you can ditch your clicker and start going for more repetitions on a verbal cue. After that, you can begin generalizing the behavior and substituting life rewards for that verbal cue. So for example, if your dog wants to go outside, start asking them for a sit and then open the door. Once my dog knows something fairly well, I begin to generalize with distractions. I may pick three locations and take my training to those places so that the dog learns to start responding reliably in all those settings. Now, remember from before, we talked about the three Ds briefly, duration, distance, and distraction. And anytime we add distraction, our reliability is going to go down initially. So it's important to take our training to the places where we want our dog to respond and uh, continue to reinforce there. So if I've been working on a sit cue, I will start to ask my dog for a sit before opening the door to go outside. You know, if I want to give my dog a, or throw the ball for my dog once they're outside, I may ask for a sit then. And then when they sit, then, you know, their sit results in the ball getting thrown. And those types of things are going to make my dog more likely to sit because they're going to realize that, you know, I've been conditioned to sit in order to get what it is I want. Okay, so how many treats do you need? I recommend having about 25 to 50 pea-sized treats. And you can use your normal kibble if you're working in a low level of distraction. So if you want to substitute your dog's meal for training time, that's an excellent way to do it. Um, and then, you know, after you're done, you know, end your session on a good note to get one last good repetition out of them and then go ahead and put the rest of their food bowl down uh, so that they can finish it. That's one way you can do that. Uh, we'll talk about this a little more in the motivation and rewards episode that's coming up next to the podcast. So where do you train and what do you focus on? Well, whenever I teach my dog something new, I start in an environment with a very low level of distraction. So this is typically my living room or somewhere where there's no one else around. If I have you know, two dogs, I might put one outside. And then the next time I do my training session with the other dog, I'll put the other dog outside just so they get used to being separated. Uh, rarely do I do a training session with both of my dogs. Um, and often what happens is, you know, I've tried a lot of different things. And so if you work with one dog um, and you click and reward them for a behavior, you know, your other dog is going to be right there in your face and it can be a little distracting to what you're doing. I would advise just ignoring your dog. You know, eventually your dog is going to get the signal that they're not getting rewarded. It's, you know, the other dog's turn to train right now and they'll go lay on their bed, you know, and you can choose to reward them for that. And so, you know, often I do tricks with my male dog, Kane, and I'll send puppy to her bed and I'll reward her for staying on her bed while I'm working with Kane. You know, that's another way you can do it. Um, you want to be careful giving her, you know, 
too valuable of a reward, um, like a bone or something that's going to keep her occupied in this situation because then the dog you're working with can be distracted and, you know, get a little put out that, you know, they didn't get that special thing that your other dog got. So I love low distraction environments. You know, you'll hear me say this a lot. One of the reasons I prefer in-home private training versus group classes is because that's the place where the dog learns best. You know, a lot of the time group classes are great. You can go and learn something, but you really need to go take what you learn and go back home and practice in a low distraction setting in order to build up that reliability. You know, don't be overwhelmed or frustrated because your dog's not getting it in a group setting. It might be that that setting is just too distracting for optimal learning. So again, when I'm at my home, since I have two dogs, I work with one at a time. And that's not to say I don't often do practice sessions for both dogs for cues they already know. I'm just talking about that acquisition stage, you know, when I'm first introducing a behavior and putting it on cue. And it may also include the fluency stage while I'm practicing that cue for reliability. I always try to focus on one behavior during my training sessions. So if I'm working on down, I may ask my dog for a sit and verbally praise them without a treat reward, then lure them into a down position and mark and reward that with a treat. So let me say that one more time. If I'm working on down, I might ask my dog for a sit to get them closer to the position and verbally praise them. You know, good, mark the behavior, and then say your down cue, and then lure them into the position. And once they're down there, you know, go ahead and mark that behavior good and treat that. And then you can also use a high rate of reinforcement. So if your dog downs, you know, as long as your dog is down and remaining in place, you can go down, good, down, good, down, good, and keep tossing treats towards your dog. That'll help keep them in the position so they realize what they're getting rewarded for and you don't have to worry about them popping up and having to put them back in a sit first. One of the reasons I advise this is because one of the common mistakes I see beginners make when they, you know, they do practice sessions and they try to run through all the cues the dog already knows, uh, the dog learns to anticipate things. So if you go sit down and you start running your two cues together, eventually your dog will stop sitting and they'll resort straight to just popping down. And that's not always practical. Like, you know, there'll be a situation where you're in public and you'll ask your dog for a sit stay and the dog will just either ignore you completely or they'll lay down. Chances are they won't lay down because they're, they're too distracted. And then they just won't respond to your sit. Um, because that's, you know, what they've been conditioned to do, but you know, there's, there's another dog in sight or maybe the surface is wet and they don't feel like doing a down in that instance. So that's something to think about and consider as well. I always try to end my training sessions before my dog loses interest and before they get full. So that answers the question, how do I end my training sessions? Always try to end your training sessions before your dog loses interest and before they get full. So get one nice solid repetition. If you can tell they're starting to get a little bit, little, a little bit more distracted and less interested, get one more good repetition and then put up your hands in the air and say, all done and immediately go wash them. Hand washing is one of those things that's become a signal that our fun time is over in my house. So anytime I'm done with something, you know, I, I can start to generalize the all done cue. So for example, if my dog starts barking, well, now that they know what all done means from our training experience, you know, I can start using it with something like that as well. Bark, 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 all done. And they look at me like, oh, okay, well, barking time's over. And that's uh, another useful reason for that. So someone, I started talking about the, th the levels of distraction, the low, medium and high levels of distraction. And when we hear things about breeds learning differently or how some dogs are smarter than others, this is some of what people mean by these breed differences. You know, what may be distracting for a pit bull may not necessarily be distracting for a border collie that was bred to work with people in those high levels of distraction. You'll kind of have to gauge, you know, what your dog is and how they're responding in these situations to determine where to go work with your dog. So for example, if your dog can perform something eight out of 10 times at home, you know, that would be the minimum criteria for moving to a medium distraction place. If your dog comes when they're called, you know, nine out of 10 times at home, start, you know, practicing your recall in the front yard, um, out on the sidewalk, um, you know, and places where there's light people traffic, you know, and then chances are your dog's only going to do it, you know, four to six times out of 10. And then you want to keep practicing until your dog's doing it, you know, nine out of 10 or eight out of 10 times or better. Once your dog can respond in a medium distraction place with a, you know, a certain level of reliability, that's when you want to start taking your training to, you know, high level distraction places, a busy park, 
crowded streets, you know, the, the off-leash trail, the dog park, places with lots of squirrels, birds, or other noises. These are the situations where it's difficult, if not seemingly impossible, to get your dog to listen to you. And anytime you increase the level of distraction, you're also going to want to increase the value of your reward. You want to save the yummiest treats for this level of distraction. So start your, just to recap, you know, start with a low level of distraction and work your way up while generalizing a behavior. And a good rule of thumb is just to respond, have your dog responding eight out of 10 times before you increase the level of distraction. If you're taking a group class, you know, don't get it in your head that your dog is trained and then assume, you know, all trainers are quacks or bad trainers because your dog doesn't listen in public. You know, you, when, when often when, you know, people take a group class, it's really just an introduction to dog training. And what us as trainers are trying to do are provide them with good habits to continue to implement in situations. You know, just because your dog is trained to sit, you can't expect them to sit. You have to make sit happen. You can't stop reinforcing behaviors just because you think your dog is trained. You know, you have to work up your dog's reliability in new places in order to produce the level of compliance you're expecting. And even then there's usually, you know, needs to be some type of sufficient motivation. So, you know, don't stop carrying treats altogether, you know, carry treats and reward behaviors you like, because if you don't, they will go away. It's that simple. So in the next episode, we'll talk about rewards and motivations a little more. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the Dog Guy Josh Show with Josh Pitts. Like what you just heard? Tell your friends about DogGuyJosh.com and join us next time.